So last time we made a great case for using the, this mysterious symbol, square root of negative 1. And we argued that on the one hand, it's an object that doesn't exist, so as mathematicians we have a problem with it. On the other hand, it showed great utility in that if we use it according to the standard rules of algebra, it actually provides some very useful results. In particular, Tartaglia's formula yields correct roots. So we can now solve cubic equations. And this is circa first half of the 16th century. So back then, back then, mathematicians, as you might expect, had a great deal of resistance to the idea because it seemed like getting the right answer based on flawed logic. And that sort of thing we encounter all the time, where we get the right answer based on wrong logic. We do it as students, we do it as adults, we do it throughout our lives. And sometimes it's a silly mistake that our teacher points out to us, and at other times it's a, it's a great insight. But regardless, what we typically do is try to fix the logical flaw, because we're afraid of using the wrong argument to get the correct result, because we doubt its correctness, and we also want to be able to use the argument elsewhere, and if we know that it's the wrong kind of argument, then that makes us feel uncomfortable. So not surprising, lots of mathematicians felt the same way. So Bambelli, who proposed doing this sort of thing, and actually laid out the rules that are pretty consistent with what we use today for complex numbers, was, was a great advocate for doing this sort of thing, despite the obvious problems. Others didn't like it so much. And I think it's a matter of a number of things. It's a matter of your personality, but it's also a matter of how many examples you've considered and how much you've seen in the breadth of your vision, and which is also a matter of personality. But I think that people who... Well, I don't want to characterize. I'll just give you a few quotes. So Cardano, who wrote that great book on algebra, and maybe it was about time to write a book on algebra, because so much development in solving polynomial equations occurred in that, around that time that it was time to sum it up. Plus, Europe did not have a great book on algebra. Algebra was an, a Hindu-slash-Arabic art, and not a European art, so it was time to write a book. And as you remember, it was written in Latin, and he used that pun, which can be translated as either uh, dismissing with mental tortures or canceling cross terms. But right after that, he says, <laughs> I didn't read to you the second half of the sentence. So the first half of the sentence, here's one translation, dismissing mental tortures and multiplying two numbers with basically square root of negative one in them, we obtain the following result. And then he continues, and as far as arithmetical subtlety go, of which this is extreme, it is, as I have said, so subtle that it is useless. So he puts it in, the, in his grand book on algebra as a great curiosity, but at the same time rejects it as a mathematical method. Another mathematician or mathematics historian described it as traveling from Moscow to Paris, this was probably later, because I don't think Moscow was on the map around that time. Well, it was, with Ivan the Terrible and everything, but I don't think it would have been used in a historical book. It's like traveling from Moscow to Paris with a changeover in L. No, no less than that. And it kind of feels like that, right? Because you have to really go out on the limb, as we saw on the board last time, and use the square root of minus one, which is which a quantity that doesn't exist and an obvious mathematical flaw, yet they cancel and you get back to real life where the answer is real and more importantly the answer is correct. Okay, so this continued for basically 200 years until it got to Euler and in his hands it received much greater further development, actually a complete development. So what makes Euler different from everybody else, other than pure genius? Well, it's the ability to see further, and it's the ability to see wider. And, you know, as far as mathematical flaws go, mathematicians work as hard as they can to remove the flaw. And also, you have to understand that these mathematicians were operating in the tradition of Greek mathematicians. Greeks were all about 
rigor, reducing everything to the least number of definitions and axioms, and that sort of structure. And Europeans were operating in that tradition, but this seems, but this seems to deviate from that tradition, where you use some symbol or object that's just not clear. So everybody was very uncomfortable with it. And it seemed like the correct way to go about it was not to embrace it, but to find a way to dismiss with it, find a way around it, find a way to remove it. But this one proved to be more stubborn of a logical flaw than most other logical flaws that you were usually able to push, uh, push deep down, sweep it under the rug, let later generations worry about this one. But this one, like I said, was more stubborn and wouldn't go away. Plus, in that state of absurdity, within the context of that absurdity, it was offering some very nice things that would only remain if you stuck with absurdity. And one of them, somebody noticed, that if you multiply cosine alpha, you know where this is going, plus square root of negative 1 sine alpha, when you multiply this by cosine beta, so choose two angles, alpha and beta, and put alpha in the first expression and beta in the second expression with cosine and sine, and you multiply this out according to the rules of algebra, and when minus square root of minus 1 meets its brother, it becomes minus 1, what you end up with, because they knew trigonometric identities obviously, was cosine of alpha plus beta, plus the square root of negative 1 times sine of alpha plus beta. This was noticed long before Euler. And obviously this, this sort of thing is only available if you accept that context of the square root of negative 1. So I was beginning to talk about Euler, one of my favorite things to talk about. So he, this, he was different from everybody else by the sheer number of examples that he's considered, by the amount of work that he's done, by the amount of branches in which he was active, calculus, geometry, algebra, you name it. So he had a very, very wide horizon. If there was an idea, he could evaluate it from the geometric point of view, from the algebraic point of view, from the logical point of view, from the philosophical point of view, from the religious point of view. He just his horizons is something that enabled him to proceed with greater confidence. And so he realized that this flaw cannot be removed and should therefore be embraced. And I will now do quite a bit of reading for you on how he introduces complex numbers in his book on algebra, Elements of Algebra, an elementary textbook on algebra. And he gets to complex numbers in paragraph 139, so pretty early on. He describes positive numbers, negative numbers, and then immediately complex numbers, imaginary numbers as he calls them. And he takes it from square one. So if you guys indulge me, I'll do some reading. We have already seen that the squares of numbers, negative as well as positive, are always positive or affected by the sign plus. Having shown that minus a multiplied by minus a gives plus a squared. The same as the product of plus a by plus a. Therefore, in the preceding chapter, we suppose that all numbers, of which it was required to extract square roots, were positive. Right? So he starts at the exact same point anyone else would. When it is required, therefore, to extract the roots of a negative number, a great difficulty arises. Since there is no assignable number, the square of which would be a negative quantity. Suppose, for example, that we wish to extract the root of minus 4. We here require such a number as, when multiplied by itself, would produce minus 4. Now, this number is neither plus 2 nor minus 2, because the square of both plus 2 and minus 2 is plus 4, and not minus 4. We must therefore conclude that the square root of a negative number cannot be either a positive number or a negative number since the squares of negative numbers also take the sign plus. Consequently, the root in question must belong to an entirely distinct species of numbers, since it cannot be ranked either among positive or among negative numbers. Now, 
We before remarked that positive numbers are all greater than nothing, or zero, so he uses words nothing and zero interchangeably. And then later on, Hamilton would use, also use the word null to mean the same thing, so just be on top of that. And that negative numbers are all less than nothing, or zero. The square roots of negative numbers, therefore, are neither greater nor less than nothing. Yet we cannot say that they are zero, for zero multiplied by zero produces zero, and consequently does not give a negative number. And since all numbers which it is possible to conceive are either greater or less than zero, or are zero itself, it is evident that we cannot rank the square root of a negative number amongst possible numbers. And we must therefore say that it is an impossible quantity. In this manner, we're led to the idea of numbers, which from their nature are impossible, and therefore they're usually called imaginary quantities, because they exist merely in the imagination. It remains for us to remove any doubt which may be entertained concerning the utility of the numbers of which we have been speaking. For those numbers being impossible, it would not be surprising if they were thought of as entirely useless and the object only of an unfounded speculation. This, however, would be a mistake, for the calculation of imaginary quantities is of the greatest importance. And then he gives one example of why they are. As questions frequently arise of which we cannot immediately say whether they include anything real or impossible or not, but when the solution of such a question leads to imaginary numbers, we're certain that what is required is impossible. So that's just one excerpt. And you can kind of see all of the doubts in some way addressed, or at the very least acknowledged. So basically, Euler tells us to not try to do away with the square root of minus one, but to embrace it. And he takes one decisive step towards embracing it, which is an issue that brought up, which is really, if you stick with this symbol, that's a bit of a problem, for two reasons. Number one, if you call this the quantity, the imaginary quantity, such that if squared produces minus one, then it cannot be the only such quantity, because as you rightly pointed out, if you put a minus sign in front of it, then we have to acknowledge, accept, that that's another quantity that has the same property. So which of those two is it? And we can't use words positive and negative, we realize that now, because though these numbers are imaginary, they do not rank among positive or negative numbers. So it is problematic. The symbol is problematic for that reason. And the other reason the symbol is problematic, which of course Euler was fully aware of, is the contradiction that I showed you where we use the standard rules of algebra to go from minus 1 to 1 and show that those two quantities are equal. So it's a problematic symbol. So he introduces another symbol, i, and just says, here you go, i is this new kind of imaginary object. So we're just, we're enriching our numbers from our imagination with yet one more object, and we're calling it i for imaginary. Okay, so here's the new symbol, the new symbol, new kind of quantity, such that i squared equals minus 1. That's, it's endowed with this additional rule. And then, of course, there is no problem in considering minus i, well, because we use normal rules of algebra. And minus i squared is also 2, but that contradiction is no longer there of not being sure when you use this object what which one of the two possible values you're referring to. Also, in this approach, there are no square roots. You never have to say square root of negative 1. It seems like a, like a tiny little nuance, but it's actually quite powerful psychologically. Because from going from square roots to squares, you at least remove a little bit of the annoying agitation, so to speak. You guys agree with me? Okay, but other than that, he doesn't define i, he just mixes it in with real numbers and starts writing things such as a plus ib, 
and just about everybody gets on board. When they see the sorts of things that Euler did with this, it became, it removed all doubt that these sorts of objects are here to stay. And so calculus got, to, excuse me, complex analysis got developed, uh, mostly by Euler, but by the time we, I would say complex algebra, and a lot of calculus applications, these numbers basically attain their rightful place among numbers, among real numbers, or I should say alongside real numbers. And then the subject was developed further, notably by Cauchy, a hundred years later. But there was another very important person, and somebody I'm a great fan of, uh, William Rowan, am I pronouncing that name correctly? R-O-W-A-N, Irish, Rowan. William Rowan Hamilton, the person I claim to be quite worthy of a musical. He, he was a great algebraist, and he was very much about the structure of calculations and the structure of logic, and all about removing uncertainties. So that's the kind of person that he was, and he did not like Euler's approach, just on an aesthetic level. So here is what he writes, and then I'll show you his solution to his objections. Here's what he writes. Confusions of thought and errors in reasoning still darken the beginnings of algebra. Is the earnest and just complaint of sober and thoughtful men who in a spirit of love and honor have studied algebraic science, admiring, extending, and applying what has already been brought to light in feeling all the beauty and consistence of many a remote deduction from principles which yet remain obscure and doubtful. Can't really argue with him, can we? In the next paragraph, he writes, It requires no peculiar skepticism to doubt, or even to disbelieve, the doctrine of negatives and imaginaries. When set forth, as it has commonly been, with principles like these, that a greater magnitude may be subtracted from a less, and that the remainder is less than nothing, that two negative numbers, or numbers denoting magnitudes each less than nothing, may be multiplied the one by the other, and that the product will be a positive number, or a number denoting a magnitude greater than nothing, and that although the square of a number, or the product obtained by multiplying that number by itself, is therefore always positive, whether the number be positive or negative, yet that number is called imaginary, can be found or conceived or determined and operated on by the rules of positive and negative numbers, as if they were subject to those rules, although they have negative squares and must therefore be supposed to be themselves neither positive nor negative, nor yet null numbers. So he is basically directly appealing to Euler's writing word for word and disagreeing with it. So that the magnitudes which are supposed to denote, which they're supposed to denote, can neither be greater than nothing, nor less than nothing, nor even equal to nothing. It must be hard to found a science on such grounds as these. Okay, so, whatever doubts you guys have about the spurt of minus one, they're all legitimate. So both sides are brilliant in their own ways. So here is what Hamilton suggests. 